Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I have uh, the honor of uh, sitting here with Rowdy Gaines. Rowdy, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Good to be with you. We're going to ask you a few questions and kind of dig in to see a little bit more about uh, Rowdy's experiences. He's uh, one of the most phenomenal athletes that, that, in my opinion, has ever lived. And, and we're so excited that you've joined us and, and, and be willing to, to talk with us here. Um, tell me just a little bit about, if you would, um, what got you started in swimming? Because I, just, just before you answer that, I think it's really important that we know what connects with our swimmers at, before they become swimmers. How do we get more of those swimmers? What, what, what was it for you? Well, for me, it was pretty simple, John, because I grew up around water my whole life. I, I was born and raised in a little town in, in, in central Florida called Winter Haven. Um, and I, I grew up on a lake my whole life. Uh, my parents water skied for an attraction in, in Winter Haven called Cypress Gardens. Oh, they sure. They literally lived. Yeah. And we would, uh, they would take the boat across the lake to work every day. So for me, it was really... Um, something that was was very natural to me because I learned to swim at such an early I literally learned how to swim before I learned how to walk I was nine months old wow. because our house 10 feet from the water literally I mean it was right on the lake and so my mom and my dad both felt like it was really necessary believe it or not this is you know 1950 I was born in 1959 so this is long before swim lessons became um Came, became a prerogative. So it, it was just something that, that I loved uh, and, and that I grew up having a passion for. Uh, much more recreationally right. growing up, but still a, a real true love for the water. And, and what got you to join the swim team? Well, I, I swam when I was about eight years old on a, on a country club uh, summer league team. And didn't swim after that and then decided to start swimming in high school. I was, a, I was an 11th grade. I was a junior in I high school. I had heard that you started late. <laughs> True, huh? Yeah, I went out to the school swim team as a junior. And really that was just, John, that was just sort of luck in the fact that I had tried out for other sports first. I had tried out for football, baseball, basketball, golf, and tennis before I went out for swimming, but I kept getting cut in all those sports. So eventually I just uh, – gravitated towards swimming. It was sort of the next sport in line. I had a very good friend of mine who wanted to try out and I was kind of helping him and getting him in shape for tryouts and stuff and decided, well, I might as well do it too. And um, didn't get cut. Fortunately, the coach kind of felt pity on me because he was also the football coach and he had already cut me once. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, later on, he said, you know, I didn't just didn't have the heart to cut you. I figured I'd let you go for a couple of weeks. And and I ended up ended up swimming in a race about two weeks after I joined the swim team, and and you know swimming, so I I I went nine minutes and nineteen seconds in the five hundred freestyle. That was okay. the first race he put me in, uh, but I went like twenty three seconds in a fifty on a relay, and uh, well, now that's a little better. On. Yeah, <laughs> that, that kind of that kind of uh, got his attention a little bit, and and, uh, and and from that point on, I knew I wasn't going to get cut anyway. What is it that drove you to become so good at what you do? Well, and I use this term loosely because it wasn't quite like that, but it became an obsession. Um, I literally, you know, after the first three or four weeks, I would go to the library back then. That's what we had. And I would check out all these books on swimming. I remember reading, you know, Mark's, Mark Spitz's 50 meter jungle. I remember reading Don Scholander's deep, uh, deep water. I, I, I remember reading all of these books. I, I checked out Doc Councilman, who's maybe the most legendary coach in history. He had written books. I, I wrote. And I, my I, coach I, actually. <laughs> yeah. There you yep. go. There you go. So That's just been a legend. And I, I checked out his book. And so I, I, I became a real student of the sport. Um, I started researching what it would take to get a scholarship in college. Uh, I would write, I wrote probably 50 schools and asked them what it would take to earn a scholarship. Yeah. Cause um, you were so late in the process to start with, right? 
And, and I would say 90% of them didn't write me back because, and, and I don't blame them. They had never heard of me. And I, you know, I was nine minutes in the 500 free. I mean, why would you write me back? Uh, but um, a couple of did. And, um, and again, it, 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 it uh, for again, for a lack of a better word, it became an obsession of mine to improve, not not to go to the Olympics. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, I had this dream of going to the Olympics when I was in high school. I really didn't. Um, I just, I really wanted to li literally earn a scholarship. Um, and, and again, that was crazy. Was right, right. And when you look at people right at that point, it's almost over. And that's when you were just getting started. Yeah, right. I mean, it was the middle of my junior year. It wasn't even in, in the beginning. It was the middle of my junior year. I started in February of my junior year. So um, it, 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 uh, it, really, it really helped me, though, uh, to become that student because I was like a sponge. Mm. Um, so getting that specific question that you had about what was it, I think it was a combination of a lot of different factors. Uh, certainly this, the, the, the help and support of my family at the time. Um, I had a great coach who uh, didn't have an ego when it came to swimming. It was like his second year of coaching swimming. So he didn't know a lot about it. So we kind of learned together. Oh, that's um, great. And I had great teammates in high school and it, that just carried on to college. And, and of course my college coach being Richard Quick, who literally became like my second father. He was amazing. Just, amazing. John, John, I was just really surrounded by people that, cared about me and I think that was also a huge reason for my success and, and none more so than my coach Richard Quick. What are what are the when, when you look at challenges um, and I, I would say it, I mean one thing starting late it seems like to me uh, like you did um, the the motivation and the excitement is there but there's a lot of catch-up to do at the same time right so what are the challenges that you faced along the way well, I think one of the biggest challenges was uh, from a technical side, you know, because I didn't have the, the technique down, obviously. I, I didn't know how to do a flip turn, you know, when I first started. Uh, I, I certainly, I swam with my head out of the water, you know, Tarzan style. I, I did a lot of things that certainly I had to learn. And, and having a coach who was sort of new too, that became – a, a challenge without question. Uh, but again, I, as I said, I, I, I was up to the challenge because I knew that I was able to be a I, I was a quick learner. I was able to look at the books and look at the technical side of things and adapt to what I was reading. We didn't have videos back then. We didn't have the internet, obviously, but I was able to really, uh, engross myself into these books uh, to study on what it would take. Let's dig in a little farther just to understand more about you specifically on how, you know, how you thought and things like this. So um, looking at what you needed to build your capabilities, and I know you did some very unique things, at least the rumors are, and I did ask you once about them and, and we'll try to find that. But um, how important would you say, because you've been through some really major races, and the most major races, how important would you say your mental game is? Well, the mental game was actually much more important than the physical part of things. I, I think when you get to a, a point where the physical part becomes so demanding, I think it, it, it starts to swerve into the mental and emotional uh, uh, category. Right. And it, uh, just an example, in, in my, my senior year in high school, uh, I did get a couple of letters uh, from college coaches, and one of them was Eddie Reese, maybe along with Doc, one of the most legendary, if not the most legendary coach. Right. In history. And he said it would be important for me to start ramping up my yardage, you know, to be able to start to work out a little bit because I was going once a day for 45 minutes, an hour a day. And he said, you, you really need to try. <laughs> yeah. But my senior, I, I, he said, you, you really need to kind of press the pedal to the metal a little bit more as far as the yards go. Well, we only had that hour workout in the afternoon. So I literally would sneak into motels in the morning to wow. go to morning practices. We didn't have a, a, a pool that was heated. So, 
for me or a pool that would be open in the morning. And we only had motels, not even hotels. Mm -hmm. So I would sneak into a motel and swim for about a week and I'd get kicked out and then you go to the next motel and sneak into there and swim in pools that were like 10 yards long. Right. And I don't, re I'm not recommending this at home. No, no, no. <laughs> this was 50 years ago or 45 years ago. So I'm not promoting that, but I did what was necessary mentally getting to your question to improve. And that was taking myself through the physical process. And I had to do that my whole, my whole career to be able to, withstand the well you know what it's like i mean it's when you're swimming five to ten miles a day in the water wow. you 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 have to have some sort of mental capacity to be able to do that forget the physical part of things right if you don't have it mentally it'll never work out physically so for me i really worked on the mental part and again it goes back to my coaches uh coach woolwine in high school coach reese my freshman year in at Auburn and and from then on coach R Richard Quick and and they they knew how to really help me emotionally and mentally fight through that physical part. And so I, we have one of our programs called Mind Works and we worked with it and I presented to the Navy SEALs and and SOCOM uh, down down uh, in Florida and um, it, it's it's kind of a, a a program that helps you focus better. So right so if you could focus better and then also to harness your emotion and have it work for you instead of against you um, or do nothing for you, right? And then also we have um, what's called progress to help you kind of accelerate your progress. So if you could focus better, right, which, which I'm, I'm guessing, right, uh, and, and emotionally, right, help, help yourself instead of fight yourself, right? And, and I think that's a big thing with, with a lot of athletes where their, their emotion, they may have some, a lot of physical capabilities, but that emotion tends to fight against them. And then, and then they can kind of get down and not, not make as much progress, things like this. Let me, let me ask you from your standpoint, when you came into your races, and you've got major races that, that you've been in, when you come into those races, did they have some kind of tools that they were able to teach you and help you with that? Or was it just more their, their kindness and their nurturing? And What would you say? There were no tools. <laughs> No, no, we, hey, you have to remember, Don, this is like you, this is late 70s, early 80s. So we didn't have those tools uh, for us. We didn't have a, a, a sports psychologist. I mean, Keith Bell, right. but we, we, didn't, we didn't have that kind of stuff uh, to be able to help us. Really, it was repetition, repetition, repetition. It's right. like real estate. You, 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 you try to repeat on where you, where you think is going to be the best place to buy. And, and you just repeat that. And, and for me, it was literally just trying to repeat the positive aspects of the mental part of swimming over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I think what really helped me, John, and what really helped me was, was specifically Richard, but he really helped me by taking those goals that you said, you know, were so important right. day to day. We, we didn't try to extend out. We, it wasn't like we said, okay, we're going to go to the Olympics in 1978. We, we didn't start talking about the Olympics in 1980. We started talking about the dual meet against Georgia next week. Right. And I think that helped me having those short-term goals instead of worrying about the long-term goals so much. I, right. I, How I, am I going, I going to get there type of thing? It's so far away. Gotcha. Yeah, it, was, it, it would have beat me up mentally. So, and, and I think, I think Richard realized that, and that really helped me a lot in preparing, just trying to survive day to day. And that's, right. that's what you're trying to do is survive during the bulky part of the season. Uh, when, you know, that, that October 1st to Jan, mid-January, where and that mid-April to mid-July part, uh, that's where you're just really getting after it in practice. And so that's, that, uh, that, was, that, was, that was the challenge of taking a day-to-day -day and getting specifically to the question of competition. It, it, again, it's just practice, mm -hmm. uh, learning from your mistakes and having a coach that if you had a really crummy race, come up to you and say, this is what you did wrong. This is how we can correct it. And this is why you're going to be better because of this. And so those things really were, were helpful um, a lot. 
So, so practice makes perfect isn't actually tr correct. It's more like practice makes permanent, right? And so you do it over and over again, you get more familiar with you more frequently, but if you're making mistakes, you're gonna be really good at making those mistakes. So you need that correction to kind of move forward and develop. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, and when you have somebody that can he, see it and help you. He was never, again, I go back to Richard, but he eliminated the NT words from our vocabulary. We weren't a lot allowed to say can't and don't and won't on the deck. It just completely eliminated them. And that meant eliminating mistakes, uh, knowing that we're going to make them. Um, but rarely did we make the same mistakes twice. Uh, he, uh, he just w would not allow it because he knew how to fix it. He was a fixer. And so you're right. And that makes a huge difference too, is to find uh, when you're finding a coach, a developmental coach versus somebody that's just kind of like, uh, more, more into um, getting a swimmer over there and then kind of getting the next swimmer and just recruiting. But to have a developmental coach makes all the difference because with councilman, he could build you, yeah. right? Versus just- Doc was so great at that. Doc was legendary and he helped me so much in my career too. Yeah, you know what I always noticed with Doc and, and I was a captain of the team in, in 84. And, and uh, so I got a chance to like work with him more and, and, and things like that and spend some time but I noticed like if we were at meets and it was really funny, we're there and the coaches of other teams came over with their swimmers. And I remember John Moffat sitting with, and I looked over and, and I got to race him, you know, and at the same time he's sitting with my coach and he's getting advice. And I thought that was such a kindness and you know, he was so sharing and, 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 and it, it sounds like you had a lot of experiences with great people like that too. I, I did, yeah. A lot, a lot of great experiences with some really kind, sweet, wonderful people, both men and women. Uh, and Doc is a perfect example. I didn't swim for Doc, but every time I saw, I saw Doc, he always had a word of advice for me, a word of wisdom that really helped me. And I'm literally swimming against you guys. I'm literally that, swimming against absolutely. you. Absolutely. And we had your videos and we, I remember you commented, I'll never forget the comment, because you, when you were flipping over, you would tend to cross your feet when you pushed off mm -hmm. because of where the, the feet were positioned. And so we got to learn that. So when we were working with our swimmers, make sure when they, they, they rotate so that as they pushed, it wouldn't cross. I'll, I'll never forget that. And so I hope I'm not telling you this too late. You probably already knew it, but. <laughs> no, 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 it, it, it's true. <laughs> Believe me, the turn took a long time to develop and um, develop not, not necessarily to perfection because what they teach you now is completely different from what we were right. taught, right? right. So, uh, but, but what I we guess, knew at that point, yeah. right. It was working toward perfection for what we had and, and the knowledge we had in, you know, 40 years ago. Right. So, so let me ask you another phase and, and I've asked you this before, so I'm going to ask for everybody else here. I had heard, and you answer this, that you would used to do a thousand pushups a day. <laughs> and no, no, no okay. that's not true. Okay. A thousand sit-ups a day. Oh, was it sit-ups? Okay, got it, got it. They, they told me a thousand. So what happens is, you know, that that aura grows bigger and bigger as you go. So the thousand sit-ups a day, how, how did you used to do that? Was it straight or? So we only did that for two years when I was in college. My junior and senior year, we did that. Okay. So we would do uh, 250 before morning workout, 250 after morning workout, and then the same before afternoon workout. And so he would break them up into four groups. But basically what it, and, and believe it or not, I, I was in Ripley's Believe It or Not for that. So it was like, yeah. <laughs> wow. I think the Ripley's Believe It or Not had a thousand sit-ups and, and 500 push-ups or something like that. I can't remember. But yeah. we would do push-ups too, but I don't remember the, the, the number on the push-ups. The main thing was the sit-ups. But basically Richard came to believe that the most important muscle in, in the body was your stomach. You know, the, the group of muscles core. in your core, your core, right. Your core became the singular, singular, most important concept of what we wanted to work on outside the pool. Right. And uh, so that's what we concentrated on those two years because back to the turns, he really wanted to make sure as I was going into that third turn on a hunter freestyle uh, that I had enough uh, enough to be able to get over quickly. And that revolved around your core. Right. Um, and, and if you look at tapes from my races from my junior and senior year, you could tell that I really had 
a great third turn in the 100 or a great seventh turn in the, in the 200. And that, that helped me tremendously. Not that we didn't do weights. We did. And we, we were in the weight room. But uh, so that's where that legend came from. And it wasn't just me. It was also all my teammates uh, as right. well. So, so you did that in college, mainly that thousand, right? Thousands yeah. of sit-ups. Okay. And then, so my next question now is just to try to understand and maybe drill down a little deeper into your technique. And, and, and I thought this would be an interesting question. Um, I, I told you my dad was a professional baseball player, and he used to talk to me about your oomph, where you put your oomph like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Same thing with like tennis, oomph like that, right? And you're headed it. And so my question for you is, during your pull, when you swam, where would you put your oomph? <laughs> Well, I mean, certainly I think as you start to make that entry point in a stroke, uh, you know, I was always taught that that, that, that was a, a kind of a non-propulsive phase of your stroke, that the acceleration through your stroke was where that oomph came into, into play. I, I think for me, John, a lot of what, from the technical side, freestyle is not, to, to me, and, and I use this term loosely, it's not it's not too technical. I don't get it. I don't get caught up too much with the technical side of freestyle. Breaststroke is technical. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know how you do that. Uh, I still don't understand breaststroke. It still goes over my head. Uh, uh, butterfly to some degree, technical. Um, even backstroke, I mean, you know, even though it's a long active stroke and in many ways it's similar to freestyle, it's, it's technical. But freestyle is such a, a free flowing feel type stroke. And so for me, the actual acceleration phase came after I made that initial entry into the water. And as I started to pull through my stroke, that's what really drove me forward as long as I knew that I was keep pushing the water back toward my feet and uh, make sure that I was accelerating to my hip and not past my hip. I think that was a, the one thing that I also helped me a lot. I didn't go too far back where I went past my hip, that again became non-propulsive. I knew to kind of flare out at my hip to get back into my stroke and keep it in front of so me. So it doesn't slow down your cycle rate? So the, the, the actual tempo of the strokes maintained itself to where I was always accelerating through, you know, we talk about the three different quadrants in, in freestyle. You know, and there's a front and there's the middle and there's the rear. I always try to keep things in the front and the middle, you know, good distance per stroke on the longer races, a little shorter on the distance per stroke on the shorter races, but making sure that, that I was really concentrating on sculling or feeling that skull or that feel or that press on the back of my hand and also in the back of my forearms, you know, a lot right. of people, and when I talk about this to kids, I said, don't forget about your forearms. I mean, the hand is where the, the most sensitivity lies, but it's really your forearm that has right, the you got paddles there. Yep. Right. It's all right. Exactly right. It's a big paddle. And so I, I don't think I, again, this is 40 years ago. I don't think we, Doc did because Doc was so far ahead of his time, but I don't think we cognizantly thought about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was something that I developed over time. Got it. But we actually um, have, uh, we cataloged all the strokes, like all the motion patterns of the strokes. And so A is for arms, H for head, T for torso, L for legs. And we did this, so you have A0 when that's out of the water, A1, which, right? And then A2 is your, is your grasping area, right? When you're doing this. And then when you start to pull, mm -hmm. A3 and A4 is where you're kind of pushing off of that water and driving yourself. And what you're saying, I think, is, is if you go into the A4 phase here, if you go too far back, you're going to get caught up. Is right. that right? That's right. But it's the, the high propulsion area between A3 and A4, whereas that's A2 right. is more set up getting ready in that with the pressure fields. That, that's exactly right. Got so it. Got, I just wasn't that technical. We that's have right. such we have such a whole language <laughs> that we've developed. So yeah, but but I could see that when when you held the water in, in the A2 section up here where you're grasping that water and getting right, you were very, it seemed like very tight in that area, like holding tight. Um, but I don't know. It appeared like you were like holding on, like you're very strong there. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, I think a lot of that was due to what we did, not only in the water, but also out of the water. I, I was, I, I couldn't 
I couldn't lift very much, but I was a monster as far as dry land goes. Mm -hmm. uh, I really believed in dry land making me stronger. So I spent a lot of time uh, in, in the weight room and, and doing a lot of dry land work. We, we had a lot of all kinds. I mean, Richard had all kinds of contraptions. We would do wheelies, you know, where you put your knees on this four by four with wheels on either side of them. Mm -hmm. And you climb up ramps in the football or basketball stadium. Wow. And, uh, and then you run down with them and then go like that again. Uh, with your knees behind you, just rolling along on this four by four connected. That to sounds pretty rugged. Oh, it was it was <laughs> terrible. I hated wheelies, but um, but again, this was designed to gain strength and do something different. Swimming can be pretty boring sometimes. Yep. And so Richard was always, I thought, uh, an incredible innovator, like Doc, mm -hmm. um, right. and and made things interesting where. You had no idea what to expect when you walked into practice. And I think that made it, uh, and I don't mean to digress here, but I think that helped a lot uh, with the mental part again, getting back to the yes. other part. But it also helped a lot with, with knowing how strong I was on my press and doing the, doing the right things in the weight room. Right. From your perspective, how would you stack rank, if you can, these issues? So you have the brain, right? You have like logical and emotional. You got technique, strength energy systems or in-water training, right, where you're getting the aerobic and anaerobic, and then fuels, what would you pick out as, like, that's one of the most important things, I think? Uh, oh boy. Sorry to put you on the spot on that. <laughs> it's a great question. I have to think about it for a second and take, and take myself back to when I was in the prime of my career. I think, John, I – prided myself with the actual training part of things. Mm -hmm. I know that's much more general, but the conditioning part for me, the aerobic part for me, right. which turned into anaerobic mm -hmm. as the season came to an end, um, was something that I think was, was my forte. I, uh, getting back to the obsession, I was obsessed with being in shape and making sure I was the first guy in the water and the last guy out of the water. Mm. Uh, and they try, you know, when I say that, let me, let me preface it by saying I was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Sure. I, I failed many times in that goal. Uh, but for me, I always, I always felt like I was falling behind if I missed a set or if I got sick, Oh, God forbid, if I got a cold and had to miss practice, I, it would drive me crazy. Um, and so it sounds to me like there's a lot of just, just when you're describing it, there's a lot of, a uh, like self, right. Your, 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 your self reputation. So self -flag flagulation. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like your, your reputation is on the line to yourself here, right? You're like, you didn't, you weren't going to let yourself down. It's almost like you're your own best hero. In general, not all the time, but in general, I didn't really have to have anybody push me. Um, you were internally motivated. Yeah. I, 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 I beat myself up a lot more than my coach could ever beat me up right. for, for missing a set or, you know, I got kicked out of workout a couple of times, uh, uh, you know, for being lazy. And Twice for me. <laughs> I'm with you right there. <laughs> yeah. I got kicked out. I, I can do it in one hand. I think three times if I remember right, three times in my life, yeah. in my life. And once was in high school. So, yeah, so uh, I, it, it didn't happen often. Right. Um, but, you know, we're not perfect. You, 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 you try to <laughs> achieve that perfection, but it, you're, you're, oh, yeah, you break up with a girlfriend or you right, break, right. fail a test or you got a little stomach bug. I mean, there were plenty of reasons and plenty of excuses to make. Right. But in general, Overall, I think if, if, if I could pick one of those things, because the fueling part, I was not very good at. I, I wasn't a great uh, on the nutrition side. Uh, I wasn't great in meats. Uh, I, 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 I had a hard time with meats, especially later on in my career with the competition side of things mentally. Uh, but I was, uh, if I was good at one thing, it was the conditioning. And I was really good at combining the conditioning, meaning I was a really good kicker. Mm -hmm. I was really good at pull, uh, pulling, using a pull buoy. I was really good if we used fins. 
I was really good on the I am set of things, except for brushstroke. And so I, I was, I was really good. I wasn't great at anything, but I was really good at everything. And I think that helped me kind of stay up with, with, with all these guys you're battling with. So uh, we had a kicker that was, I mean, he, I, that's what he was known for. Billy Forster. I don't know if you remember Billy Forster. Yep. Uh, bronze medalist. He, he could kick better than anybody. So my goal was to try to stay with him. We had a guy named John Smith who swam for Texas. He could oh, I know John. I've stayed over. <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. Right? And But he was the best puller. on. He, he was a better swimmer with a pull buoy on than he was with it off. Mm -hmm. Much better. Right. He would do like crazy times with a pull buoy on, but he took them off and he wasn't as good of a swimmer. So my goal was always to try to stay with him in pulling. So again, <laughs> those are all little tricks that I would play on myself to, to be good at conditioning. And, and it's interesting you say so what what are the challenges that you you had when you're saying when you weren't a good racer because here very interesting you're saying that because here's olympic champion that was pretty good at racing <laughs> at least right so what what was it that that was happening when you're when with from a mental standpoint if you can describe it all that well from the racing standpoint um i i i think i'm just like everybody else you, you get overwhelmed with the moment with with the situation at hand and sometimes that overwhelming moment led to swimming fast meaning that the adrenaline worked in your favor and then sometimes the adrenaline worked for me in a negative way that in the fact the adrenaline happened too soon like it would happen the night before and i'd sleep three hours or it, it would happen in between prelims and finals, and I just get overwhelmed with worrying about things uh, and, mm. and stressing about what it would be like losing. And but I think for the most part, John, we we take those trials and we again we learn from them. For me, as far as racing goes, uh, I think I had to rely a, a lot more on my teammates and my coach. Than, than the training part of things. So I needed that support. I needed that energy that those teammates provide. Winning the gold medal was a perfect example. I, I wish I could have won 40 gold medals because I would have given one to each one of my teammates on that, wow. on that team in 1984 because they all were amazing. so supportive mm -hmm. of each other, but certainly supportive of me in my moment. And so for me, I... I guess it's, it, it's advice I, I, I try to tell kids. Don't feel like you have to put the whole weight of the world on your shoulders, especially when it comes to racing. It's okay. You're going to have those feelings. And for me, I, I, I think a lot of it was just relying on, on that team atmosphere that swimming can provide in many ways, especially in competition. I didn't need it in training so much, but I definitely, because I swam by myself a couple summers with Richard. One summer I broke the world record swimming by myself in a 25-yard pool with just me and Richard. Wow. So I didn't really need it from a training standpoint, but boy, I needed it from a, a competition standpoint. Just for a moment, since you mentioned this race, can you take yourself back for a moment to the 84 Olympics and you're standing behind the block or maybe just before you go walk up to the block? What's going on in your mind there? Well, a lot of it, what was going through my mind is just the fact that um, – that I was really proud to get to this moment. I, I, I was, believe it or not, I was pretty relaxed as I walked out before my race. Beforehand, I was nervous, <laughs> but everything leading up to that moment, John, worked out perfectly. You ever had, it, it, I'm sure you have, but ever you've had a race where everything just works out perfectly for that, that one shining moment, mm -hmm. um, meaning the prelims. I got a good night's sleep before, before before prelims. Why? I have no idea, but I Right, which is good. very uncommon. <laughs> really uncommon. So I felt, I slept pretty good. Not great, but pretty good. And I had the perfect prelim in the fact that I, I really met the goals. I, I took a risk in the fact that I needed to lay off my legs as much as possible because leading up to that race for about two years, I, I, I laid too, way, way too much money on my legs in the prelims and I didn't have legs in the finals. So I said, you know, I got to take this risk. If I'm going to win, I got to lay off my legs. Little things like that. And then I got a perfect nap before the before the finals. I slept like two hours between prelims and finals. So, for 
for me, everything worked out perfectly. So when I walked out, I kind of thought to myself, wow, I, I feel great. I don't feel tired. I don't feel stressed about this moment. I feel really good. And what and a the, wonderful feeling. <laughs> it's great. I didn't have many of those. But uh, the last thing I felt was the fact that I deserve to be, and I don't say this in a cocky way, I just say this in the fact that I deserve to win because I was the only swimmer in that final to have made the 1980 team uh, and didn't get a chance to compete. So for me, uh, I felt like well, you guys are going to deserve your moment in the next later. Or next, for me, I deserve this moment because I've worked harder than any of you. Right. And, and I think that helped me relax too, because, uh, and one last point on this, I, I think my coach has prepared me perfectly. I had the perfect start. And again, that, the start is a whole nother separate story, but he prepared me perfectly for the start. So I got off to a great start and uh, we could have swum that race 10 times, John, and I would have lost nine of them mm. because I was not the best swimmer. <laughs> I was the best swimmer in 1980, but I wasn't the best in 1984. I should have been fifth or sixth in that race. But for that one singular moment, Richard prepared me perfectly. And I felt that confidence on the block. And, 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 and you did deserve it. And I think everybody in the stands were knowing that too. <laughs> you had a lot of, uh, lot of positive people. What keeps you so incredibly humble and upbeat? Well, having four daughters and three granddaughters <laughs> definitely keep you humble. But that happened even before that, though. <laughs> I, I think for me, John, I, I think it was always, um, I always felt so blessed to be in this situation where I could perform at a high level knowing how late I started in the sport. I, I, I don't want to get too corny, but I think the Lord, the Lord really blessed me with a gift. I think uh, he I did. Think. And, and, uh, and I always was, believe me, there were cocky days, buddy. Trust me. <laughs> I had plenty of cocky days where I thought I was the be all, but most of the time I was humbled by the fact that, um, I was just so blessed to be in the situation because, you know, as I, as I talk to all these teammates around me and all these swimmers I'm swimming against, they're all saying what well, they started when they're seven, eight, nine, mm. four, three. I mean, and I didn't. And for me, I think the Lord uh, really gave me a gift and, uh, and I didn't want to throw that gift away by, by being an idiot uh, for the most part. Um, and, um, and, 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 and I also remained hungry all the time. I always, like I said, I was hard on myself. Uh, and not so much in races. If I had a good race, I would be proud, but m m mostly it's centered around practice. I would, I would constantly be striving for perfection and for practices. And that kind of kept me humble too, because I'd say, well, you, you didn't do so hot today. You didn't make that, you know, you didn't make those eight 100s on 105. You didn't even make the interval. I mean, how can you even say you're any good? So for me, it was it's such internal motivation. I think that's what, what was a big difference between me and a lot of my competitors as right. well is right. When, when, when it's you that's telling you that, Hey, that's not good enough. Yeah. You're not, and, and it doesn't have to be in a negative way. Cause if you beat yourself up too much, right. right. And, and, yeah, and if you right. marinate it, you're not going to, right. Okay. But if, if, if you, let yourself know realistically, I can do better. And right. I think if, if we ever look and are honest with your, ourselves, you know, are we doing our best at any time? Probably not. We can get, we can do better. There's things that we can do to get better. And if we look at that for ourselves, it just changes what we can do. That's right. You're right. You're absolutely right, John. I, I think you're, you're so correct in the fact that I think we, we keep striving to do and again, it, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but you just keep striving to do better and better every day. And, and for swimming, it's a great thing. And the fact that there's always something different, it's always a new day. And that's why those short-term goals were helpful. And then they were helpful, and not only to help me swim faster, but also to help me stay humble uh, right. because those goals kept changing, you know, daily. I never get tired of talking about swimming. Me <laughs> neither. <laughs> all day long and never get bored with it. So 
uh, trust me, when, when you want to talk about swimming anytime, I'll be glad to. This was fun. Well, we're going to take you up on that if you don't mind. I just really appreciate it and, and uh, wish you all the best, Rowdy. Thank you. You too, you too buddy. Take care. Take care.